everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on the grand finale of our very last Destinations International series of small destination organization webinars. Um, I think as many of you know, we are a little over 300 strong, which is a large percentage of our Destinations International membership. So the small but mighty continues to grow. And I just want to um, welcome everyone today. A few quick housekeeping notes. We will be looking at the question board, so feel free to type those in at the very end. And I'd like to introduce um, two people. First of all, Melissa Laughlin, um, CEO of Visit Vacaville, California, and our fearless leader of this committee. Hi, Melissa. How are you? Good morning, Kate. Great. Thank you. Um, just quickly wanted to say thank you to all of you for participating, not only in the webinar today, but supporting this webinar series um, on a month to month. I know many of you make this um, a, a monthly must do, and um, we appreciate the support. Hopefully, um, you're taking a lot away from um, the content of these webinars. I've been, we've been so pleased with um, all of our presenters and just really thank you. Um, for supporting them and happy holidays. And we look forward to resuming these. We're dark in January, so we look forward to um, resuming after the first of the year. Awesome, thank you, Melissa. And with that, I'm going to introduce Justin Vogt, who is the Vice President of Business Development at Fuse Ideas. Hi, Justin, thanks so much for uh, spearheading this for us today. We're excited to have you and the team on board. I'll let you take it from here. Oh, great. Thank you, Kate. Uh, thanks so much for having us. We're uh, excited and happy to be able to uh, join the group today. Um, so with that, I just wanted to do a quick round of introductions um, so we know who's speaking on the phone from our team at Fuse Ideas. Um, I am Justin Vogt, Vice President of Business Development for the agency, and I'll let uh, the rest of my team introduce themselves. Hi, Hi I'm, I'm Wilson. <laughs> I'm an account director in the tourism vertical at Pew's Ideas. Hi, I'm Christy Horseman. I'm the account director also in the tourism ver vertical. And I'm John Mernier. I'm the uh, director of digital media and analytics at Pew's Ideas. Great. So um, as we all know, our topic today is strengthening the shoulder season. And we wanted to share with you just some strategies, some targeting and some messaging tips uh, that are, you know, as a destination, you might be able to utilize for growth. Uh, based on what we've seen in our experience in the destination marketing space um, of which we've been a part of working with clients of all sizes uh, for over the last 13 years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren who will get us started. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for having us today. Um, so I'm just going to go over really high, from a high level perspective, what is shoulder season? And I'm sure most of you know, um, but it's really not the peak season and it's not the off season. It's that period in between. So in most destinations, we find that summer and winter are peak based on school schedules, but sh and shoulder tends to fall in the spring and the fall. However, this can really change based on what the weather is like in your destination and if you have very event dependent destinations. So for example, I'm based in New Orleans. Our peak season is in the spring um, because that's when the weather is the best. So there's Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest. And we see a shoulder season in the late spring, in the late winter. Um, so it's also important to be aware of many shoulder seasons. So there, these might be holidays that you have high traffic or um, really even school breaks like fall breaks that have come into being. So if you could go to the second slide, um, if you're wondering exactly where your shoulder season is, it's something that you can actually scientifically plot. Um, in the 60s, analysts really noticed that visitation patterns to destinations followed through bell curve. So on this graph, it's that red line. So you could take your visitation for an entire year and plot it and create a trend line. And wherever you see the peaks, you'll know those are your peaks. But then if you look at the portions, the upswing and the downswing that really fall between, let's say two and one, it's really the negative two wow. and negative 1.25 and on the other side, that will be your shoulder season. So this is a really good way, not only to define your peak season, but also to find those mini shoulder seasons. So if you see a peak, you can say, 
oh, that's a peak season because of this, and I really need to look at these times around this to capitalize on shoulder season. Um, so why is, sh why is shoulder season important to you um, as a brand, as a destination? Um, a lot of times it allows you to showcase different offerings than what you're known for. So you might be a beach destination that has amazing food, but the beach always overshadows it during the summertime. Um, it can give you the opportunity to have repeat visitation. So you can remarket to people who are visiting during peak season and get them to come back in the shoulder. And it's always that little nod of, you know, off the beaten path. This is what all the locals know. This is what you should really come for. Um, you might also be able to attract new visitors who might not be drawn to your core offering. The thing that I think is the most interesting about what shoulder season can do is it can really turn a seasonally dependent destination into um, a longer term, more viable year long destination and a better place to live for residents and for tourists who are visiting. So you start to have attractions and businesses that are staying open longer in the year. The workforce starts to stabilize. You don't have as many people coming and going based on the season. You're then able to attract better hospitality talent. So your product offering gets better. Then you start to see a demand and the revenue for infrastructure improvements. This could be things that benefit tourists like signage and you know, running and bike paths, but those are also beneficial to the people who are residents. So roads and hospitals and schools. So it's, you know, shoulder season can not only benefit you as a destination, but it can benefit, you know, the marketers who live there all the time as a place to live. The last thing I do want to point out, um, if you do have a place that is very, um, over touristed during your peak season, this allows you to spread the love a little bit. So why is shoulder season important to consumers and visitors? So travelers are really catching on the shoulder season. I mean, there's a ton of benefits, lower costs, better availability, smaller crowds, a lot of time really mild weather that isn't as drastic. Um, but, you know, really as booking windows decrease, we see a lot of people uh, going after more shoulder season opportunities. Um, you know, cost conscious families may be willing to pull kids out of school, but we're seeing a lot of other sub segments going after shoulder season. So I'll turn it over to John to talk more about that. Cool. Yeah, thanks Lauren. So as we start to think about planning for shoulder season, you know, one of the first things that we'll want to pay attention to is who our key, audience, key audiences are. And while some of these audiences may vary based on the destination, there are particular audiences that we're keeping an eye on that may be valid for many DMOs. The first of which is the, what we call the proverbial empty nesters. These are typically your boomer or Gen X couples who do have children that have either moved out of the household permanently or are away at school or college. For DMOs that typically have a strong summer destination visitation, um, such as beaches or lake destinations, the late summer, early fall shoulder season is typically the best time to reach and connect with this audience as it's the time where uh, really to wind down from the busy grind of entertaining extended family. You know, after Labor Day, when the kids are back in school, the weather's nice, it's a great time to pack up and get back some of that us time, right? The second audience that we like to consider is the millennial couples, especially ones without children in the household yet. And this could also include older Gen Z too. In general, these travelers require a shorter uh, lead time for travel planning and are more likely to embark on impromptu weekend trips, even throughout the year. Uh, they typically look for things to do that tap into the local flavor or authentic nature of the destination um, and tend to stay away from places that have a lot of tourists or heavy crowds unless of course it's a music festival and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but this audience really, along with the next one, um, are very much influenced by social media when they're planning and likewise love to use social media while they're actively in the destination. Solo travel, while it's not anything new per se, is a phenomenon that's really taken over over the past, last few years, especially with the younger millennial and Gen Z audiences. Uh, according to some research that Focuswire did, solo travel actually makes up one out of every five global bookings and rose 9% just in the past year. 
And this trend has really contributed in part by the rise of social influencers who curate off the beaten path trips uh, and tap into that fear of missing out or that FOMO effect, right? Solo travelers also spend more time on the road um, than other travelers. On, and on average, we're typically looking at around 19 days away um, per trip. Um, so this is the perfect audience to show all of that your DMO has to offer. Let them really maximize their time in the market and let them curate their own experience during their stay. And then finally, as many of you might be familiar with the leisure or the business leisure audience, it's really important to keep in mind, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. It estimates three in four business travelers take part in every year. In fact, some research shows that 90% of millennials took part in uh, leisure trip last year, uh, and that's myself included in, in, in that 90%. And we can think of leisure almost like a taste test or a home staging, right? Bring them into the destination through the business and tease them with all the other fun and interesting things to do while they're there um, and get them excited to come back um, and maybe with their significant family or significant others or their family later on. It's important to keep in mind that this travel audience, the leisure travel audience is typically values relaxation and are okay with spending more money on accommodations or services. So as you might notice, the common denominator here is that across all of these audiences, audiences there's a non-presence of children in the household. And that's not necessarily to say that your DMO wouldn't cater to families or multi-generational audiences in shoulder season, but based on our experiences and research, we're typically seeing that these audiences are higher indexing based on the seasonality factors that Lauren had mentioned before. So we talked a little bit before about how some of the audiences are more likely to pack up their bags and take off. Uh, we're actually seeing a similar trend in the industry right now across all of our audiences. In fact, according to some research that we pulled from Adara, just this year we're seeing a drop in almost two months of lead time for winter travel right now. This means that folks that were previously planning winter trips later in the summer or early fall are more likely to do so closer to that trip date. Now there's a lot of factors that are in play, uh, the economy, timing of the holidays, weather, uh, but while holiday travel is not necessarily the same as shoulder season, which we're talking about here, in general, we are seeing that travelers are less afraid than ever to book last minute trips. And part of this may also be contributed to the rise of alternative accommodation options like Airbnb, VRBO, which, op which offer more options than ever now. In terms of messaging, it's important to keep in mind, you know, if we can push last minute travel deals, late season incentives, it's a good way to tip the scale. Think about incentives that would speak directly to the weekend warrior, especially those from local or regional drive markets. The opportunity for the rubber tire uh, travel is higher than ever now that gas prices are rather stabilized. It isn't much of an obstacle than it was a few years ago. And with that being said, Dry markets are definitely important feeder markets for shoulder season, as we mentioned, but it's important to remember that the world now is smaller than it ever was. I'll spare you guys the, the hit song from Disney World, um, but by that I mean more so than ever, we have access to literally a world full of data at our fingertips. Data sources like online search behavior, credit card purchase transactions, content consumption habits, mobile app usage, physical latitude and longitude data based off of your mobile GPS. It's all information that we have access to right now as advertisers and brand marketers. And whether you like that as a consumer or not, it's real. Um, and, you know, the creepy factor is definitely there, but the data exists. And, you know, if we have the information, if the data is there to be used, um, it can make our marketing campaigns even more strategic and smarter. The map you're seeing here actually, which we pulled from a company called Distillery, shows what this would look like visually. It's pulling all households in the US that are indexing over 100% for a luxury travel, and that's based off of a variety of different data segments. As you can see, there's pockets of the country that way over index for this audience. And if we were only targeting specific markets, we might be missing out on some of those people who would fall into that target audience. Big companies like Google, Facebook, they've been doing this for years um, and typically are the first stop shops for hyper-targeted campa campaigns. But there's some other marketing tech companies like Adara and Sojourn that are focused on gathering travel search data from hotel, flight, 
and rental service partners and connect that to marketing and advertising campaigns. And what that really means is having the ability not only to target these individuals, but to attribute their bookings back to the channels that led them to a purchase decision. And Adferent uh, is also a company that just started working with Visa to do this within the destination itself. So not only are we able now to see that a person was served an ad, they searched for a trip to the destination, they booked a trip to the destination, they showed up in the destination, but they also made a credit card purchase while they were in that destination. Again, creepy, yes, maybe. Uh, effective, absolutely. The takeaway here is that we should see geography as not an opportunity, uh, sorry, not a limitation, but an opportunity. Uh, traditionally speaking, yes, going national would require a lot of budget. But with a hyper-targeted digital media approach, it's easier than ever to maximize our spend efficiencies and speak to your audience in a one-to-one -one manner. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Christy, who's going to show you some uh, tactical ways to do this. Great. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so we're going to go through some several opportunities for you to actually grow your shoulder season, use the target audiences that John spoke about, and then also target local, which could be the drive market, um, along with people who are right in your backyard. This first slide we're talking about is going to be activities. Um, with ski resort being a hyper-focused seasonal destination, they're really looking to grow their market because they only literally have three months of actual travel weather where their snow is good, and that's if you're lucky. So we're seeing a lot of ski resorts actually targeting audiences that are already coming for the winter and getting them to come in the shoulder season. They started to create things like mountain biking. Some already had mountain biking trails and just expanded on them, cleaned them up. A few examples would be the Killington Ski Resort in Vermont. They had created a really expansive mountain biking trail system. Um, it covers almost both hillsides, or mountainsides, I guess you should say. And um, they were able to charge for entry, rental, and lessons. That's a lot of money coming in. That also takes into consideration not only the adventure seeker who are always coming to them, but also the people in the backyard that can drive to them. I actually know people who drive from only one town away where there is a ski resort in the spring on children's spring break to come mountain bike at Killington because they've done such a great job um, of really making that mountain bike system available to families, advanced mountain bikers, um, as well as others. And then another example is Holiday Valley Ski Resort. That's located at about an hour south of Buffalo, New York. They created an adventure park. Um, it's a little bit less expensive and they were able to do things like rope courses. Um, they did put in a mountain coaster for children and draw in families for that off peak, I mean that um, shoulder season such as spring and fall when they have spring break or fall when they're coming into some short weekend holidays. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, another activity is going to be for the beach destination. This is a great way to use some of the target audiences that John spoke about. So maybe not your traditional beach goer who's coming for a long stay during your peak season um, with their family or their um, significant other, but it's going to be for those people who are boomer travelers, um, maybe the longer stay, the 19 day stay. They're going to start advertising and possibly putting a little bit more media spend to that shoulder season to promote all the activities that are overshadowed during the beach season, um, such as hiking trails that already exist, biking opportunities. This is an example of a bike opportunity on a boardwalk. So you're not putting a lot of money into your infrastructure because it already exists. You're just putting a little bit of money back into media and you can do the hyper-targeted audience um, focus like John spoke about, or you could go national if people are flying, especially if it's going to be a spring shoulder season, which would be like a spring destination for spring break. Um, I don't know if John, you want to speak a little bit about the performance since you, I know you were. Oh yeah, there. absolutely. Uh, more than happy. You know, we, we, uh, as Christy mentioned, this destination had been doing summer uh, marketing uh, for years and really the, the shoulder season was something that was brand new. Um, and it's really all about squeezing that last bit of sunshine um, out and, and, and coming to the destination when the crowds aren't there, but the weather is still nice as Christy mentioned. And, and what we actually saw from the first year of doing this was a 28% increase in tax revenue and an, uh, an ROI of $169 to every dollar spent. So really, you know, being able to be focused,
extending your marketing season out a little bit longer and really maximizing on that uh, can really make an impact on incremental revenue for your destination. Great. I think I forgot to mention that's actually a destination that's located um, in New Jersey. It's a small beach destination. So they utilized what they already had because they didn't have a big budget to develop any of their infrastructure. All right, so we're moving on to another opportunity. It's gonna be events. A lot of DMOs are having really great success with hosting events. I'm sure you're seeing them pop up all over your social media. Um, people are utilizing Facebook a lot for event planning. Um, but this is a great way in the shoulder season to draw a different kind of target audience than maybe what you're seeing in the peak season. And it's gonna help people um, who weren't aware of you prior to that. It's gonna help stabilize that roller coaster of the off peak season, I mean, of the peak season to off season as well. Um, festival is something we're seeing grow ex exponentially, really, in the last three years. Jackson Hole, Wyoming, although it's a, considered a ski resort, they do have two major parks that are considered local to them, and they play a big factor in getting people to go to those parks. So they're not only just this great ski destination, they had to start thinking about their local partners such as Yellowstone and Grand Teton. So they have a fall arts festival. Um, they went the long game. They didn't have a ton of money to dump into this massive festival and do massive advertising. So about 35 years ago, they created a um, fall arts festival to draw that artsy crowd out into the fall, out to their destination. Um, and they saw great results for the local national, uh, the local parks, the Yellowstone and um, into the fall season. Traditionally, both parks saw close to 50% drop in visitation from August to September. Um, and so with this long haul festival, they slowly grew and now it's huge. As of 2018, um, they dropped less than 25% for both of them compared to the 50% drop from before. Um, so if we wanna go to the next slide, thanks. Okay, so this event slide is more about festivals that are short term gains. People took a little bit more of a upfront budget spend. East Aurora, New York, puts on a Borderland Music and Arts Festival in early fall um, to help sustain the flow of tourism. It's just outside of Buffalo, for those of you who are not familiar with <laughs> East Aurora. The festival focuses on integrating regional unique assets. Um, it's really mostly a music festival, but they do have local arts and craft vendors that come um, to set up booths there as well. In just two years, the festival has attracted over 30% um, of its fans from beyond its local market. So people are traveling from, Buffalo has a big Canadian following, so a lot of Canadians are coming down, so it's also becoming more of an international focus as well. And then lastly, the event is going to that leisure travel um, and business. I think it's something that people tend to overlook or have a small piece of their destination budget go to business, but this is a great opportunity, as John said, with that leisure crowd really growing with the younger generations. Clear Lake, um, which is in Houston, just launched, a, I think it was a year a year ago, so launched a building community conference, and it was really just to bridge the destination marketing organizations and the travel writing communities. So they took what they already knew, the, the tourism department. They knew this was a gap. They were struggling with it, so why not create a whole entire conference around it and invite people in? Um, they were able to draw DMOs from more than eight states, Canada, and over 40 travel writers attended. They're gonna look into having this as an annual event to continue to bring people in. And this is gonna be a great opportunity to start bringing in um, those weekend deals so people will stay longer than just the conference day. Um, and then also partnering with local businesses to help their keep their doors open past the peak season into say spring or fall or whenever your peak season ends for restaurants and other business local markets that would normally close their doors. And then the last piece, that um, is definitely overlooked, I think, in a lot of planning measures is going local. Um, the local visitor is just something you don't really think about because, hey, they're already there. And we're thinking short local visitor, meaning someone who lives in your destination or at least within like a 30 to 50 mile radius. Holiday Valley, again, pops up as a good example. They have a beer and wine festival that's slowly growing over the last five years. Um, it's hosted in the late fall. As you can see a trend here, fall's still got that pretty warm weather. weather. There's beautiful foliage in most locations and it um, helps promote local regional craft beverage scene, which is exploding up there. So they took an industry that was really doing well and made it into an entire event. Um, it markets mostly 
to its local community. So Buffalo being an hour away, that is majority of the people that come down to this event. <laughs> they do get people from Pennsylvania and Canada, um, PA, Ohio, and the Buffalo region in New York are all considered local markets. because They're all within 15 miles. Canada is just over an hour. Um, they offer stayover packages. Restaurants have specials. As I mentioned before, it's a great way to keep those doors open for your local community. Um, they have events, <clears throat> events on the mountain. Um, they invite local residents to come help support the local community. Um, and in 2019, they actually even had their first local college booth to uh, help promote certifications in brewing. And that was a school right in Buffalo, New York. So you can, you can see it's expanding not only to let's just go taste beer and wine, to let's talk about how our entire region really has a healthy promotion educationally. It's something we enjoy and it's something we can make into a career for you if you enjoy it enough. And then the last example of going local is Miami Spice Month. Um, they feature a fixed menu with signature dishes at reduced prices during August and September, um, which is Miami's low season. And it just really helps drive that traffic to restaurants who would otherwise be slow. And a lot of it is going to be all local community members attending these restaurants at a reduced price, less of a tourism season, so there's less crowded behavior. And if you're, I don't know if any of you guys live in a local tourism area, it is, it is a godsend to be able to go sit down at dinner and not have to wait and have it be super crowded. Um, traffic to Miami's website actually increased by three to four times due to the local traffic reviewing the menus and planning their night out. Great. So just in summary, um, there's a lot of information that the team just shared with you here, but you know, the key points, uh, takeaways from this is, you know, follow the demand and, you know, the demand of your audiences, expand your horizons. You know, focus on your opportunities for your particular destination with your audience, with your timing of the seasonality, and with the geographies as well as John spoke to. And then, like Christy just alluded to, you know, think about the various um, unique activities and events within your region, within your market, that you can create to increase that demand of visitation to uh, to your destination in these shoulder season time periods. And don't be afraid to go local, support the community, support your own local market, and uh, you know you can support the you know the local quote unquote visitation from that perspective. Um, so we knew we, we got through everything pr uh, pretty quickly there. There's a lot of information, but we'd love to uh, open it up if there are any questions for the team. Fantastic, you guys. I expected nothing less than our <laughs> creative friends at Fuse Ideas. So lots of really cool um, concepts. So I'd like to invite everyone to go ahead. If you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear those in the question board. Um, again, we'll also be sending this recording and the um, deck follow up and connect you directly with this, uh, this awesome team at Fuse. But um, I have a few questions for you guys. Um, what are the best media channels for promoting shoulder season on a low budget? I think that's pertinent to this group. I can take that one. Yeah, absolutely. TV, TV, TV. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, uh, no, I mean, as, as, as I mentioned kind of before, you're really going to want to use digital media um, to really maximize your budgeting dollars. Um, in terms of getting the most bang for your buck and creating efficiencies, digital is going to be the way to go, and it's going to be the way that you can speak to your audience in a one-to-one -one manner and get personalized. Um, I think specific tactics, um, you know, search and social uh, are, are table stakes. I think social media especially is a way that you can um, penetrate these local markets, whether it's drive markets, whether it's national, really hone in on these audiences based off of their interests on social, and also have the ability, the ability to get visual with your creative um, and uh, use a, a few different tactics like rather than just in feed sponsored posts, you know, using uh, sponsored stories through Instagram, um, videos, carousel units. So there's a lot of different uh, tactics that you can do on social media. For leisure travel, you know, LinkedIn might be an opportunity to target that professional or business traveler. So it's not always just about Facebook or even Instagram, although those are the biggest players in social. You know, if budget allows to, uh, I, I would think of uh, display and definitely content. 
Um, content marketing, you know, that can span across all forms of media, whether that's paid, earned, owned, or social. Um, really, I would recommend starting with the owned, right? What are some things that you can put on your website that talk about the different uh, amenities and activities and events that are going on during the shoulder season? If that content lives on your site, uh, people are going to be able to find that, um, and it's going to create a better SEO um, for you as well if they're searching for the, that, those types of keywords. And then from there, amplifying that message out through paid channels as well um, and driving them through that. So it's really following the bouncing ball, but I think really using hyper-targeted so, uh, digital forms of media is the way to go for, for media. Awesome, thanks. I'm going to try and unmute. Uh, John Wild had a question. John, can you hear us and talk? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. perfect. And John, I, I can't tell from your email, but can you tell us uh, which destination you're with? Uh, the Auburn Nopal like in um, Auburn, Alabama. Awesome. Thank you for being with us today. What's your um, question for the team? Uh, I've um, heard of only large bureaus that ever afforded um, um, engaging credit card companies or others with data, that spending data, um, mm -hmm. or um, linking at certain periods of times when people come to your uh, town where they're actually from. So is that an affordable option for smaller DMOs? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, typically there is a level of investment involved in partnering um, <clears throat> with the types of credit card companies, whether that's a Visa or American Express. Um, you know, there there are ways to work around that by not going directly through credit card companies directly because there typically is that investment um, as well as scale too. They, they, the, these companies need to make sure that you're targeting enough people where you can actually show some attribution that that goes back to the data. Um, but partnering with, uh, you know, companies I mentioned at here in one of them, there's other ones that are out there, um, is a way to, to work with them both on the media side as well as putting that data in through the partnership. So you're not working directly through them, but really through the media partner that has access. So that's one way um, that you're, you're able to get access there. There's also, uh, you know, there's segments that you can target efficiently through the, the Google uh, network as well, Google Ads. Um, it, it may not be exactly working directly with the Visa or American Express, but there are some type of purchase data segments that are already loaded in through Google that you might be able to tap into pretty easily. All right, thanks. Any of that's appreciated, or any references, please. Yeah, that's a great question. If you guys have any resources um, that you would like us to include in the follow-up to the group, I think we, it's, we were talking about that um, last week in our advocacy summit, you know, just visitor spending and intel. So I think that that's, John, I'm glad you um, brought that up. So thank you. Um, another question, how do we determine what shoulder season tactic works best for my destination? Christine, you want yeah. to? I think um, I think it's going to depend on the destination. There's not like a simple answer to that question, but let's just say you're traditional um, and in the majority and your shoulder season is going to be spring and fall. Um, events are huge in spring and fall. It's a great time to travel. People are um, for business. It's a great time to get people out the door, learn about your destination and um, people are already back in the swing, kids are back in school, they have a routine and are able to probably go on a business trip more than they would be in the summer when kids are home. Um, for festivals, uh, people are big travelers in the fall. The weather is still very warm. People like being outside, particularly in the fall, because it's not, if you're in, like, say, New Orleans, it's not 110 degrees. Um, and even destinations like Buffalo and Boston is much more bearable in September and October than it is, say, the height of August and end of July. Um, <clears throat> so if you're in the majority, events is probably going to be your biggest win. It is a little bit bigger of a budget item, though. And so if you do not have that, I guess, budget to be able to put on an event, um, the other way is the go local, which is very minimal budget to you, and you actually become a good partner to your local stakeholders and businesses. You just basically have to work with them for individual weekender packages and how, you know, they're 
I highly doubt a hotel or a restaurant is going to scoff at giving a discount a, a month where they're going to be closing their doors traditionally or barely staying afloat if they keep them open. Um, so going local or offering, offering weekender packagers, which we didn't go into super big depth here, we've seen work really well for big destinations and small. And like I said, it's not a ton of money for the destination. It's actually just a great partnership with your local vendors and restaurants. I think just to add to that real quick, Christy, um, when you're thinking about events, um, think about the events that are fit kind of naturally mm -hmm. or authentically with your destination. I think that's pretty important too. You know, we wouldn't recommend if you are, um, you know, Portsmouth, New Hampshire to put on a Burning Man festival. Let's right. say. I don't know. That was the first thing that came to my mind. Um, I don't know why. But, but you know, think of think of the, the types of events or activities that really kind of distill the nature of what your destination is all about, and it doesn't seem too out of the box there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it kind of gives these travelers a reason to get there during a certain period of time. Oh, I always knew that the cherry blossoms were in bloom here, and I've always wanted to go there. There's a festival. Let's let's do it. Let's let's pack up the bags and go. So really think about that authenticity aspect of it, and that's going to really, I think, uh, move the needle on the people that you want to bring to your destination. Absolutely. Like I said, Buffalo saw great success with the uh, Holiday Valley being one hour away, craft beer being an industry that's exploding. So really look at your current market. What what is trending? What are people going to that are even local? Because people are probably willing to travel as well. Fantastic. Um, I think that concludes all of our questions that have come in. Any final comments or um, anything from you guys? Uh, no, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity. We're happy to, you know, share, you know, the learnings that we have from working with our destination clients um, here today and, uh, and happy to be part of uh, Destinations International. Perfect. Well, we're so appreciative of the support and um, great thought leadership you guys brought to the table today. And as I mentioned, we'll be sharing the follow-up deck and also posting this on our member form. I know we had a lot of people that wanted to be on today but could not, so you and your team will be able to access, access this uh, great content later on our forum. So thank you all to our Fuse Idea team and then also to Melissa Laughlin again. And um, we just appreciate everyone's support and participation. Great. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. You too. You too. Bye. Bye.